So, uh, Steve Walden has been coming to our meetups since, like, uh, right from the very start, and he's probably given more talks to our meetups than anyone else. But typically, they were like economics or some not so explicitly technical talk. So, of course, Steve has lots of talents. In this case, it's very much a technical talk. I think it's a wonderful. Steve took me through uh, at least some of his tools and some related tools in the past. I think it's a wonderful exercise here. Um, so I'm very much looking forward. I'm going to interject one thing, but I think it's really it's quite cool about the tool. It's not going to say we'll run out Raspberry Pi Zero. In fact, it's going to run out $5 computers. And it's quite, you know, quite fun. Okay, so also HD events, since well, there's going to be a little bit of network stuff happening, the network was used with in the past for the drug here. What are the details? Anything I'm missing, Sue? No, great. it's all good. So thank you so much, Chris. So JVM, eight, any, 8 and anything after will be fine. It's On the website it says it asks for an 8 JVM, but it, uh, it works fine on an 11 JVM too. Um, so any JVM that you have. Uh, if it's a very old Java 8 JVM, there's an issue with... Um, what do you guys think? It's so hard to know which is better. I mean, you're better than myself. Well, so I guess we'll probably mix it because um, it's definitely better to see this with the lights off, but then how easy it is to work. Mostly, I, you know, I'm, I, I plan to sort of slough off the burden of this talk to you guys because I really want I, I really want it to be an exercise. So let's let's get started with this. Um, so um, this is what's what's new for this presentation. I have slides, but they're recycled slides. As I said, I've given you talks about this for a while. Um, this is an exercise, and it's my hope that over the course of um, this event, um, you guys will participate in this exercise, and there will even, assuming nothing goes wrong, which of course it often does, um, but there will even be prizes at the end of the exercise. So let's um, go through this little application. So this is a smart contract. I can share the source code for the smart contract. Um, but that's, it's easy to get lost in code. It's easier to just look at the interface. So there is a contract. It's deployed already on Ethereum mainnet um, called Quip. And it works like this. You can, with this smart contract, add Quips. So if we look at the public mutators down here, you can add Quips. Quips are just, well, they're strings. They're whatever you want them to be, but they should be entertaining and engaging and short. Um, and um, as people add quips, the quip count will go up, and we will be able to get the quips and the Ethereum address of the quipper. Right? So this is an Ethereum smart contract. So every time somebody does something that changes the blockchain, these mutators, there's an address associated with doing that. And so the um, contract retains both the delightful quips that you guys will come up with and your identities as an Ethereum address. Now, if you have no idea how you would you know, call these functions or have an Ethereum address, this is the talk for you. We will go through that. Um, but so you can add quips to this thing. That's one thing that you can do to it. The other thing that you can do to it is you can vote on quips. You're not allowed to vote on your own quip, although you can get around that if you're clever because you can make as many identities as you want to in Ethereum. And so you can civil attack this contract if you want to. Um, I haven't tried to do anything to prevent that. Um, but you can't literally vote for your own quips. You vote for the quips that you think are clever. Um, and at the end, I will call the payout function. Um, and the payout function will literally give somebody some money. I don't know if that's legal, but I don't think they're going to shoot me. Um, so I, I, I purchased like $20 in dye 
yesterday. Um, and the way that the payout function works is it will choose among the votes for a quip, and then it will send the money to the quip author. So we'll try that. So the three things you can do to this thing are you can add quips, you can vote for quips, or anyone who wants to can make a payout, and the payout will go to some quip author. The probability it will go to any quip author is weighted by the number of votes that they have. Um, so anybody can call payout and give money to somebody. I will be doing that at the end of this exercise if it works out. Um, so I hope that it does. The payout function is a little bit interesting. I think it's a fun thing that you can do with Ethereum. You might, you might notice that it accepts a token address and an amount, and it's also marked payable. Um, so in Ethereum, you guys... You need to make it slightly larger. Oh, is it difficult to see back there? I'm sorry. Sure. Please let me know about stuff like that, because I'm inept. Um, so um, the payout function will let you make payments in ERC20 tokens if you give a token address. Um, or if you set that address to zero, it assumes that you want to pay Ethereum, and you have to pass enough Ethereum to the function. If you pass more than you mean to send, it will send it back to you. So. I expect to most of you, you've probably, you know, read about, thought about, played with Ethereum applications, but seeing the smart contract interface like this, it's not obvious how you would actually do these things, how you would interact with this contract, right? And that's the problem that SPT Ethereum, my software, is intending to make progress on. It wants to be like a shell, a terminal, for those of you who are, you know, kind of geekish, you know, there's a sense in which on a, on a Unix-like computer especially, you can interact with programs and applications and the web and all kinds of things, but when you really want to touch things, when you want to change things, when you really want to know what's going on in a computer, there's nothing like a command line. And so SBT Ethereum is really about taking that sense of having a place that you can just touch and play and interact directly to the Ethereum blockchain. So let's try to demystify it a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask you guys, so I'm going to go just a little bit through the CAN slides. I'm going to spend not too much time doing that, but I'll do that for a couple of minutes. And my hope is, again, the prerequisites, the things that you want to have to be able to make progress on the game, the exercise. Be so excited if you get some exciting quips posted before the event is over, are a Java virtual machine on your computer and Git, right? So if I bring up a shell, you know, if I type Git, it says something, it's here. And if I type java-version, there's a JVM. It can be JVM 1.8, or it can be the newer release version, which is 11, 1.11, or whatever it would be, they'll be fine. Um, it can't be a super old JVM 1.8 that hasn't been updated for like a year because they didn't have the, um, they're missing the SSL certificates and so you'll have a problem. So while I talk a little bit through the slides, um, try to make sure that you have those things on your computer and, and then we'll, we'll kind of take a break and get started. Um, big play. That looks better. Okay, so these are the can slides I've used for previous talks. Um, so do you guys, who recognizes this thing? <laughs> okay, a few of you. Right, this is a bit of text that was embedded in the, um, in the genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain. And even though this is Ethereum, not Bitcoin, and there's little civil wars about these things, I consider this the most important expressive act of the blockchain movement, right? What does it mean? Why is there a bit of random newspaper text embedded in the Genesis block of the Ethereum blockchain? I think my interpretation of it is it, it's a statement of independence. It's a way of saying that the 
institutional and financial world in which we were caught up is dysfunctional and corrupt, and we want a way out of it. Um, so from my perspective, my interest in blockchains is motivated by that idea, by wanting to, um, I hate to use the expression in the current Brexit context, but without any, without any meaning to analogize to that, but for people to take back control over their own financial and institutional life. Um, I'm, this is me just sort of talking shit. I'm disappointed by the way that the blockchain movement has gone because instead of helping to train people to build their own institutions, to take control of their own finance, in my view, the blockchain industry, that word industry is itself, from my perspective, a marker of a problem, um, have decided to basically compete with software companies and banks in doing what they do. So we're talking about getting users in the same way that startups talk about them, sort of plankton, as things that you do for your numbers. We try to build software um, to be fail safe for people who we presume to be effectively infants, who we presume don't have rich communities, don't interact. Um, instead of experimenting a lot, one thing to me that was always, I'm in another life as sort of Chris alluded to, I am an economics writer um, and I have a lot of like experimental interesting ideas about things I might think might be interesting in terms of economic arrangements or decision making or voting systems. Um, but if you think about blockchain software as being similar to um, web service, Web 2 style software, where Web 3, we're just doing Web 2 again, but we are using a blockchain as the back end, um, then all of a sudden you really need these very sexy user interfaces. User interfaces um, are, um, what's the, right, they're, they're, the, they're a kind of opiate. It's very nice to have a nice user interface when you're interacting with an application. Um, but whenever you interact with an application, um, you're constrained by the boundaries of a user interface. And often the nicer the user interface seems, the more constrained you are by the things that the user interface encourages you to do and discourages you to do. Furthermore, from the production side, user interfaces are the most expensive part of most applications to produce. Right? As we'll see, it's very easy with a tool like SBT Ethereum or with Truffle or any other tool to write a smart contract and get it deployed on the blockchain. It's very hard to make a sexy application that your mom can use. Yeah? I mean, I think also user interfaces are uh, tools now where um, you can be programmed or to elicit certain behaviors because you're 100% focused on that and you're very susceptible to, um, you know, certain yeah. choices uh, and stuff. And absolutely. You're, so you're placed in an environment under somebody else's control, mm -hmm. and so therefore you're subject to their interests. So, yeah, that's another uh, like, interface that's, uh, Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, the ethos behind the version of the blockchain movement that I like and the free software movement that I like is a, an ethos of human agency, right? That Software shouldn't control you. Humans and human communities should be able to use software to be agents in the world, to control the world, to shape it. Um, whereas the technology industry we're sitting in the heart of, from my perspective, has done quite the opposite over the last couple of decades, right? Has treated the public as a user base that's a source of finance and attention, um, but is busy acting as an agent trying to extract money and attention from its user base rather than meaningfully provide agency to diverse individuals and communities who might do whatever the hell they want to do that, that the people in the software industry might not think about or approve of or whatever. Um, so I think, I think it's been a catastrophe how much the blockchain movement has tried to sort of mimic um, 
the broader software movement. And besides being a catastrophe in an ethical sense, it also means that we've, exp we've we're, we're failing, right? I mean, you guys know this. I mean, this is, a, I, this is actually a good turnout for an Ethereum meetup lately. And I'm <coughs> grateful to you all. I'm actually really flattered. I didn't expect it to be as big a turnout. Um, but the blockchain movement so far is failing. And it's failing because to this day, no one has come up with something that you can do on a blockchain that firms quickly haven't been able to say, well, you can do the same thing, you know, more efficiently, more quickly, more sanely in the fiat financial system. Um, there's nothing big in the blockchain world that anybody needs to use. Everybody who is involved in the blockchain world from a user motivation rather than a developer or an ethical motivation, for the most part, either the one killer app is speculation and the whole infrastructure of exchanges and trading and derivatives and whatever that's around it. So there is a kind of casino application that is novel for which there is a genuine user base. Many of us have participated in that. I don't mean to be disdainful of it. But a new casino is interesting, but it's certainly not what I got excited about this for. Um, yeah. Do you have any ideas how to break out? Because I agree with that. And I think people are so focused on the monetary aspect. And they don't understand the, the censorship resistance aspect, which is I think more intriguing about this technology. Is there any way to think about how to move it towards that? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the point that I would make is that the, we need more people running lots of small experiments rather than people doing ICOs or post-ICO VC funding raising millions of dollars and doing large experiments. So instead of doing thousands of, when I learned about this stuff, I'm a programmer, I got excited. I'm like, I have lots of little weird economic ideas. Let's try it out. But instead of doing that, instead of lots of different people trying out a million ideas, we had you know tens of ICO companies hiring everybody up. And that was nice for a while. You could make a good living at it. Um, but the number of experiments dropped to very few. The vast majority of the effort of all of those ICO companies, not all of them, there are a few, a few exceptions. Protocol Labs, I, I think, is you know, an example of one that's doing good things. But most of those companies devoted the vast majority of their technical resources to user interfaces, to trying to overcome the fact that like MetaMask is really annoying, um, to trying, to trying to make it work for your mom to have a crypto wallet. Right? Um, so we ended up doing, running a very small number of experiments funded by a lot of money. Things that are funded by a lot of money tend to be derivative and conservative, right? Because you don't want to lose the money. Um, and we haven't done anything new and inter interesting as an industry. I just can't really name. I mean, there are, there's always something being hyped that sounds interesting. And within narrow domains, like if you ask me, like, is there something exciting about a, um, a um, Stark-based um, um, non-custodial decentralized exchange, I'm like, yeah, within the domain of like exchanges of tokens, that's actually a cool and interesting technology, but how exciting to the world as a whole is the notion of another kind of exchange, right? You have to be like lost in this very narrow focus before you can find things. Now to me, the, the thing that's most exciting about the blockchain stuff isn't just the censorship resistance, but the fact that you can do it. Right? If you want to do something that involves weird movements of money, weird movements of economic value, and you try to do that using traditional infrastructure, you have to write contracts. The lawyers have to write the contracts that are really good. They're very expensive. If you want to do it in a way that involves a technical system, you have to get permission from a bank to be able to use their infrastructure. You need millions of dollars to overcome the legal and regulatory costs of designing a kind of collaboration or arrangement through which money flows in an unusual way, right? Whereas with blockchain software, you can just do it yourself, right? This stupid little thing I'm having you do today is an example of a kind of application that you just couldn't do before blockchains existed, right? It's stupid and simple, and I'm not saying that it's like, you know, that there's something special about this application, but the idea, the fact that you can have a little idea and try it out and get a group of people this big together and start playing with real money and seeing if it's useful, 
I think is fantastic. I would really like to see people like splitting their checks at dinner. I have a friend, whenever we go out to dinner, we got annoyed about fighting over like who pays a bill, and so we flip a coin about it, right? Well, let's do that as a blockchain app, right? It's, it, they're that easy to write and that easy to work with. Um, and a lot of kinds of interesting ways people try to collaborate with money can be reified in smart contracts and thought about and iterated on. Um, I would like to see people trying all kinds of little bespoke arrangements that never have big websites, that are never big apps, that are never big companies. Um, you know, we want to collaborate together to go for a trip. We're going to do uh, an assurance contract, right? An assurance contract is like Kickstarter, this arrangement where everybody kicks in some money. And if, you, if it reaches a certain amount, then it all goes to something. Right? Well, if we want to, if we want to get a bunch of friends going on a trip together, instead of like picking somebody to collect the money, why not let it be a smart contract? Right? There's a language here. There's a set of capabilities for humans that makes interacting with how we let value flow between us, economic value flow between us, be as malleable as ideas are with words and text. I think this is a. I don't think we want an industry where there are products. What I think we really want is a world where this way of interacting is something that is widely understood and known and available to people. Um, but that's not the way we've been going. Um, so anyway, the ethos of SBT Ethereum, the blockchain is the DAP, a smart contract as we saw at the very beginning, this kind of, um, let's see if I can make this go down. Here it is. Um, this itself is a kind of a user interface, right? You don't need a whole lot more than this if you have the right tools, <laughs> which is what I'm showing you, right? You can add quips to this thing. You can get the quips back. You can make payments that are weighted by how popular the quips are among the voters with just this user interface. You don't need anything else. The blockchain itself is the application. You don't need to spend a lot of money building something sexy if you're excited about the application itself. Um, that, doesn't necessarily, that doesn't mean that everybody in the world will do that. I don't expect every, you know, my mom is just never going to drop into a terminal of any sort. It's just not a thing she's going to do. That's not saying anything, you know, mean about my mom or my dad for that matter. They're just never gonna do anything like that. But humans have always been like this. Um, it's not a matter that everybody is supposed to be sort of a geek to work with blockchains. We've created this world where there's like either geeky things that only geeks can use and it's like a priesthood or else like it's gotta be like Facebook, like some stupid thing designed to walk you through the direction that the firm wants to walk you through. But historically, there's a giant place in between, which is when my mom or dad wants something technical done, they ask me, right? The idea isn't to make it so that there's a priesthood, a small priesthood of developers, and then this large world of applications for everybody. The idea is to create a set of skills that not everybody has, but that is very widely dispersed. So everybody knows somebody who has them. Within everybody's social community, is somebody who can help you with this, right? If I need, um, I, I don't know, um, if, if I need artwork for something, I'm bad at that, I can't do that. But maybe I know somebody who can do it. It's not a priesthood, it's a skill that's out there that's widely available and dispersed. Um, that's what I think we should be hoping for with the blockchain space. It's like writing, not everybody is a great writer, but it's also not confined to a small priesthood. You, should, you, you might not be interested in being dorky in any way at all, but you should be able to be socially connected to somebody who is. It shouldn't be this very specialized skill that exists far out there. Um, okay, so SBT Ethereum, what is it? It's basically a shell for Ethereum. Um, you can use it to develop and deploy smart contracts. If you are a developer, if you happen to be a Scala or a JVM developer, it generates a lot of carefully thought out, scalable, high performance tooling for integrating smart contracts with Scala or JVM applications. Um, you can also use it to develop your own command line interfaces. 
Um, I'll show a little bit of an example of that today, but um, there's this, as I've been doing this for a couple of years, there's sort of a style of software that emerges where first you write a smart contract and then you decide you want a little bit of a better user interface than the smart contract itself. Um, and so I've extended SBT Ethereum to being a platform for writing very quick and dirty, very fast CLIs that automate a little bit of the annoyance of working with the smart contract interface. We'll see that in our little example. Um, yeah? What do you mean by compatible blockchain? So Ethereum has effectively de defined a kind of standard now, right? So there's Ethereum mainnet, and there are all of its test nets, Robston and Rinkeby and whatever. Then there are offshoots. The first one was ETC, right, Ethereum Classic. Um, now there's POA Network. There are a couple people here who've been involved in POA Network. There are things like Thunder Labs. Um, and there are a variety of new blockchain projects that, oh, hey, hey, oh, hello, um, that um, also basically offer a compatible API. So from a, from a user's perspective, the Ethereum network is defined by a, a web service, a JSON RPC API. Um, and they're now, I don't know, probably about 10 different public chains that offer that same interface, and SBT Ethereum is happy to work with any one of them, um, and is designed to make it easy to switch between them. So, so right, that's what you would work with Woodstock, right? Because it, it is a uh, game uh, virtual machine. It, with which one? Woodstock? Um, so, yeah, so that was... Uh, uh, <laughs> an EVM on the Bitcoin blockchain. I don't know whether they offer the same JSON RPC API though. So there are some EVM based blockchains that take the Ethereum virtual machine, so have the same format of code, but don't actually have the same kind of broader structure or offer the same API. So you'd, you'd have to look at, at it. Some, some EVM, you know, there's I think um, Hyperledger Burrow uses an EVM, but it's a completely different um, API. Permission blockchains, though, like um, Quorum, do offer the Ethereum API, so you can use this tooling against it. Um, so you, you, whether a particular chain or technology infrastructure supports the API is just a thing to look up. So the tooling just uses the standard ETH underscore API um, that Ethereum has popularized and that is shared, again, by about somewhere between five and ten public blockchains that I know of um, use it and any permissioned Ethereum blockchain like Quorum or um, Proof of Authority, Parity or whatever. It will work with any of those. It's designed to make it easy to switch between them. So we'll see, I think, the next slide here is that SBT Ethereum is super stateful. So in order to make it really easy to work with the blockchain, basically SBT Ethereum remembers everything that you've ever done with it. Um, we'll see there's a lot of annoying things about working with the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but SBT Ethereum approaches, as soon as you start running it, it creates a little database on your machine. Um, and everything that you need to interact with, to interact with the blockchain, which are mostly these things called ABI, we'll see those in a second. You need node URLs. Um, you need addresses, which are long strings of hex digits, but SBT Ethereum lets you give them easy human names for them. All of this stuff is kept for you in a database to make your life really easy um, when interacting with things. Um, and in a multi-chain world, it's all scoped by chain ID. So as you switch chains, all of these different things that you've used for one chain live in one universe. So if there's a, you know, an address that represents a certain application on POA network, it doesn't represent that same application on mainnet. So when you switch between them, it won't have the same name anymore. That the special alias that you've given to your application on POA network isn't valid for mainnet. SBT Ethereum is very smart about that. Um, 
So it creates a database, makes your life easy. This will be less abstract when we talk about it. Um, it's sort of friendly. So sort of, the, the letters of sort of should be big, right? There's no, there's no denying that one, this is like a text base, a shell style tool. It's a command line tool. It's a lot easier than a Unix style shell because a Unix style shell usually requires a lot of switches that you just have to know. The way that SBT Ethereum is friendly is that the command names are very long and very descriptive. You know exactly what all the commands do. The downside of that, the reason the Unix world doesn't use long descriptive shell command names um, is because they're difficult to type. They're annoying to type. So SBT Ethereum's main kind of user interface hack is tab completion, right? So the, the names are too long to be anything other than horrendously annoying to type. You hit tab all the time. Um, by hitting tab, you can get to the end of the name, find the name of the command that you're looking for. Um, you can also figure out what arguments the commands need. It'll give you a lot of relatively, um, uh, relatively rich information about what it's asking for. Um, the long names have consistent conventions. So a lot of times what you're doing with things is basically setting up a kind of configuration, right? Like, okay, if you're interacting with Ethereum, you have to do it through a node URL. There's gotta be an Ethereum node that you're talking to and it has a URL. Um, you set that URL with a long command with set at the end. If you wanna drop that URL, you say, use the same long command with drop. If you wanna see what it is, you use print. Let's just do it while we're here. Let's just do that example, right? So if I go to where you'll be in a minute, oh, wow. So this is an SBT, SBT Ethereum command line. In a minute, I'm going to walk you through getting your own one just like this, ETH command line. But if, just to show the example we're talking about, ETH node URL, right? And if, if I hit um, tab, you see there are bunches of, complete, of completions of that. They're long names, they're intimidating. I wish they weren't so intimidating. I actually wish the tab completion would just do it one level at a time. You'll see that they're defaults and overrides. That's a pattern in SBT Ethereum. So for every kind of configurable thing in SBT Ethereum, you can configure a default. So I can do default set if I wanna set my default node URL, excuse me. Um, and then it asks, in tab completion, oh, that's not visible there. Let me bring it in. Um, it asks for the URL, right? If I hit tab again after the command is done. There's a default URL, um, but then there's also an override. I have the same drop, print, and set for overrides. So the idea is when you get started in SPT Ethereum, you want to set up your defaults. Right? You want to set up basically a default sender is the most important default. Who you interact as, what address you typically interact as, um, and a default node that you interact with. But SBT Ethereum doesn't want to restrict you to that. So there's also a notion of override. An override only persists for a session, only while you're using it. When you quit your session of SBT Ethereum, your override will be gone. Your defaults are stuck in a database and they're there forever, right? So as an example, if I type ETH right now, ETH is, gives me a, just a quick overview of where I am, of the current session. The session is now active on chain with ID one, that's Ethereum mainnet. Um, and there's a node URL. You saw a warning here, which is a warning that you'll see, which is that I haven't set my own default node URL so it's using a hard-coded back backstop. That hard-coded backstop is just an Ethereum node that I maintain, but there's no guarantee that I'll maintain that well for you forever. And if, if 
the software gets popular, you know, I won't be able to afford to do that. Um, usually what you want to do is get access to your own node. If the, an easy way to do that is like with a service like Infura. You can sign up and get a URL and then you have a more reliable service provider providing a URL. But for now, this will work fine. This is a node that I run, current center. If I do this, if I do ETH node chain ID override, and I say three, that's the Robston network. Notice it's chained, right? I don't run my own Robston node. So that's an Infura URL. Right? My whole little universe has changed as soon as I switched URLs. And I can drop that override. And now I'm back on my original chain. Or I could have overridden it again. For all the commands marked override, using override is the same as override set. It's just that override sounds like a verb, so I made that easy. Um, Okay, we're going to do this from the beginning to get you guys started. I've gone on too long already with this stuff. These are the few, the basic commands we're going to use to get started. I'm not going to talk you through them now because we're going to do that. Um, SBT Ethereum is very batteries included, so ENS is fully supported. Anywhere you type an address, you can type something, whatever.eth. You can use it as an ENS client if you want to register or extend ENS names. It's pretty much the only functionality that's not supported is reverse ENS. Forward ENS is almost completely supported. Anything that you want to do on ENS, you can do an SBT Ethereum. If I type ENS and then tab, you'll see lots of commands for manipulating ENS. Um, ERC20. <laughs> ERC20 will work with a little bit today. Um, the the contracts are very simple. The API is very simple. You can work with it directly by interacting with the smart contract. The only thing that's tricky about ERC20 tokens is that one token typically means 10 to the 18th atoms, right? So if I want to buy one die at the smart contract level, that's actually 10 to the 18th units. Um, and so it gets a little bit annoying to do that conversion. So um, SPT Ethereum offers a bunch of ERC20 commands that let you use human units for things or do the conversions yourself. Um, Etherscan, the only thing that it has to do with Etherscan is to work with an Ethereum smart contract, we'll see when we go through the demo, you require an ABI. That's the first and most essential thing that you need to interact with an Ethereum smart contract. If you <laughs> Sign up with Etherscan and get an API key. It's free. You can set it. It's another one of those set, um, set print, drop kind of things. Um, if you set an Etherscan API key, then if contracts have been validated, have been verified on Etherscan, SPT Ethereum will automatically download them for you. So we'll see that in a minute. So that is a thing I really recommend you do. It takes a few minutes, you know, you gotta sign up, get an account at Etherscan and get the key. But once you have that, you hear about some smart contract, you know, you like read about like Fairwin or whatever. Oh, did I do Fairwin? I don't even know. You know what I'm talking about? It's the one that's like taking up all of, all of the space and um, using all the gas. Yeah, look, right here it is. These are the things you can do with the Fairwin contract. How did I do that? I just downloaded the ABI from Etherscan. Um, and now I can try to mess around with it <coughs> if I want to. Um, OK, um, so lots of things. Um, it's super powerful. It's easy to get started with. But if you want to take full control, you can send transactions with arbitrary data. You can override the nonce to be whatever you want. You can set the gas. It will, it will automatically compute the gas that you need for most transactions, but sometimes its computation will be off. You can either set your own gas price or gas limit yourself, or you can do things like ask for a markup over the default gas price to have more flexible control. Um, every time you see an ABI, this is really important, 
Some of you don't know what that is. We'll do it. We'll go over it more directly in a minute. But the thing to remember is basically every time you interact with a smart contract, you need to get together this information, this meta information about it before you can use it. FBT Ethereum is super jealous. Every time it encounters that information, it saves it and associates it with the address. So once you've interacted with a smart contract once, you can interact with it again and again very easily. You'll always have it. It's permanently in a database. If you don't like it, sometimes you get the ABI from a smart contract, but in fact, you want to work with it through a different interface. So sometimes, for example, their smart contracts are designed to be proxies of other contracts. So their native ABI doesn't actually reflect what you can do with it. SBT Ethereum lets you name ABIs in your database and lets you arbitrarily override the ABI associated with the contract. So you can interact with any contract through any ABI you want. Um, usually that will fail if it's not the actual ABI of the contract. But if it's a proxy or something special like that, um, you can do it. So it's, it's designed to be easy to get started with, easy in quotes from a nerdy kind of way, easy with a little bit of nerdly willingness to play on a text-based thing and whatever, but not be limiting. You should be able to do anything and everything in Ethereum, interacting with arbitrary specificity, building smart contracts. From a programming perspective, um, if you're interested in JVM programming, it builds very rich stubs that are carefully designed to be careful of resources. So you can, you can use the stubs in a high performance environment and it's not gonna do things like hold network connections open or threads open for too long. So they're smart stubs if you're doing Scala programming. If you wanna test your smart contracts in SBT Ethereum, you write your tests in Scala. So um, these are examples of if I have a contract called doc hash store, this is how I can build an example of a stub and how I can call a function on that contract. Um, this is someone who was asking earlier, event handling. Uh, the stubs, um, the tools that SBT Ethereum will generate for you in Scala include event publishers and subscri uh, event subscribers, excuse me, um, for smart contracts. So you can write, if you write a smart contract or even if you just have the ABI, you can generate um, a, an event publisher that mirrors the smart contract and then you get the events from the smart contract as typed events in Scala that you can pattern match off of and respond to in an on next method. Um, right, so these are the events of that contract stored, amended, open, closed, authorized, deauthorized. And this is code that catches those as typed objects in Scala um, <coughs> that reflect those events. Um, good. So now this is, that was longer than I had hoped for it will be. Now I want to get you guys started. <laughs>